Uh, is that okay back there? Sounds too loud. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt to put it down just a little bit. Testing one, 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 mm -hmm. one. Better? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's one thing to hear it up here, but it's another thing back there. Is that still too loud? Is it okay? All right. I knew I had a soft voice, so that'd probably work. All right. Revelation. Chapter 2, verse 12. This is actually a very practical portion to the churches. It's, there are points that are reiterated throughout the scriptures that are, that are uh, oops, I'm trying to keep things open. Right side, I'm mean in here. And nothing goes out. I'm trying to keep the prayer requests open on my cell phone, and I just put a smiley face after a serious prayer request, which is not what I like to do. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll fix that later. I don't think it's going to make it through the metal building, which is a good thing. <laughs> All right. Verse 12, uh, a repeated theme. Technically, I'm only going to make it through one church today because there's so much to say about Pergamos in and of itself. So, Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So you also have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows saving he that receives it. As we pick up here, we begin with uh, this angel. It was pointed out to me uh, recently that that angel, not only speaking of uh, that which entity which may watch over a church, but you also have to understand uh, really the, the backdrop of angels. Um, the prophet Malachi, Malachi is the Hebrew word for angel, the way we anglicize it at least. And uh, uh, angelos or something like that is the Greek word for angels. It means messenger, ultimately. So whether you were talking of, and, and the angel of the Lord was one such messenger in the Old Testament. Most of us believe that was Jesus uh, before his birth, his incarnation. Uh, there's some passages I still scratch my head over, but I mean, that's why we study the Bible. Um, there were the cherubim, and how many of you would have liked to have met a cherubim from the Old Testament? Raise your hand, good and high. You did not, uh, because the cherubim usually was associated with judgment, okay? Uh, it was the cherubim, again, in the Garden of Eden that has his sword going every which way. Cherubim guard uh, God's glory. They are messengers. Uh, and then there are seraphim, uh, which if you had to meet an angel from the Old Testament, I would far prefer the seraphim because you had a chance. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah sees a seraphim. He has six wings. Two wings, he covers his eyes. Uh, two wings, he covers his feet. And with two wings, he flies. <coughs> and in that temple setting in Isaiah chapter 6, they're calling back and forth to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah is looking at that and he says, Woe is me, for I am unclean. I'm living 
in a land of people of unclean lips, and, and he knows that he has to be cleansed. So it is a seraphim that takes a coal from the altar and places it upon his lips. Now, he's not hurt by this, but the whole point is that it purges away that sin uh, and makes him suitable for service to God. So again, you have them, the seraphim interacting at least as a go-between in the situation between the prophet and God. But also, as you look at messengers, the prophets themselves were messengers, were they not? Malachi was a messenger. And so if we want to run with that interpretation of it, it's only fair to say that those who take God's message to people, including you, could be referenced in that manner as an angel. So it's possible, is it possible, and I'll, I'll leave it to you, uh, because I'm, my mind's not made up 100% on this, but are we looking at the church leadership of these uh, seven different churches? I'm just going to bring that to you as a possibility. Um, and he says, These things save he that has the sharp sword with two edges. Uh, before I make that comment, I want to uh, fast forward to the last statement in every one of these, and that's, he that has an ear, let him hear. What's the point? A whole bunch of people could be doing the wrong thing and rowing the whole direction, the wrong direction. Is this speaking to the group, or is this speaking to the individuals that make up the group? I believe it is the individuals. You know, you can have a whole bunch of people doing the wrong thing, doesn't mean you need to cooperate with it. And so he, you individual that is hearing what God has to say to you, pay attention. <laughs> Sorry. I, of course, thought of Jimmy when I said pay attention. Jimmy was a, was a wee one back in the day, and about the age of two or three, he'd stick out his little finger and when he was talking to us every once in a while to get us to listen up, and he'd say, pay attention. <laughs> so now you know what uh, my precious memories <laughs> that, that I think of. But uh, listen up to what God has said. What about this part about a sharp sword with two edges? Uh, and I know where you are living. Uh, I'm going to get there in a second, but let's talk about where they're living for right now. This is Pergamum. It was really never an important place uh, until after the time of Alexander the Great. And after Alexander the Great, uh, his time was up, they literally uh, made it a, uh, a capital of a group of people called, and I'm probably mispronouncing it because how do I know how to pronounce these ancient names, the Adelids. So it was a capital region for quite some time. Then approximately about 30, BC, no, 133 BC, the king, the last king of the Adelids, wills it to Rome. Literally wills it off. As he dies, it's in the will. Rome will receive this area for themselves. And Rome did take it over. Uh, but this place isn't really like a lot of our towns that we've talked about Ephesus, Smyrna. They were great trade towns. They're on the ocean, they can send boats in and out. This place is 15 miles inland, so it's not a great trade center, but what it did have was an incredible library. It is a religious center and a uh, political center, if you will, for this area. Uh, interesting, is it not, that when we mention that it's a political center, who is the ruler of this region, ultimately? Your Bible says that's where Satan's sitting, all right? So it's a, it's a bad spot, it's a bad place to be as far as, as, far as uh, ruling goes. And, and there's some very tragic things that happen in this passage uh, associated because anytime you plug in the equation of the devil, you will get probably some degree of genocide or murder. You will have a large group of people being, being deceived and there are two areas that these people are gonna be deceived in. One is by the way of Balaam, the other is by the way of the Nicolaitans. I'll get there in a second. That's why this one's so long. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a very dangerous place 
physically speaking for a Christian to be because they will probably be persecuted and pretty good chance they might also be killed in that area. Um, as we look at this then, uh, they, they have this huge library, 200,000 200, parchments. I mean, talk about your man cave. This is Eddie's dream <laughs> right here to be in this area. And in fact, it's interesting that Pergamum it actually means parchment. So, you know, the town of the library, if you will, in, in, our, in our vernacular, that's what Pergamum means. It's the Morgantown Library of Asia Minor. <laughs> okay, so that kind of helps piece it together. That's what they're known for. It is also, um, like I said, a religious center. How many of you have seen on medical buildings the snakes around the poles? That comes from Pergamum. One of the things that they had in Pergamum, Pergamum, and it's a name I wouldn't pronounce if I could try it, uh, but it was the snake god, <laughs> and he, he would give you healing. And there were two snakes that sort of represented that. In fact, it's, take a tour down that, which is strange and bizarre with me. If you wanted to be healed of whatever disease you happen to have, you could go spend a night in the temple of the snake god, and they would allow snakes to just kind of roll across you through the night, and that ought to fix you by morning. Uh, and it fixed me good. I'd have had a heart attack, and I'd have been permanently cured <laughs> of any disease that I had to that point. So it is gross, uh, but that's kind of how this particular god, Asclepius, functioned. It was also <clears throat> home to some of the other uh, Greek deities that you've heard about, Zeus and Dionysus and Athena, uh, the goddess of war. Uh, and it's a big Caesar worship place. I mean, all hail Caesar, get your pinch of incense like we talked about with Smyrna, drop it there, pay your homage to the god Caesar. Uh, and any time, incidentally, when you see a human being being elevated to the to the level of God, what are you seeing a foreshadow of? You're seeing a foreshadowing of this last entity called the Antichrist that we're gonna that we're gonna study. So it happened with uh, oh Eddie, I'm gonna draw a blank, so I need your help. The Greek guy that uh, ravaged Jerusalem. Antiochus Thank you. Yeah, did you hear that? <laughs> Antiochus Epiphanes. Oh, for those out there that <laughs> want to know. Uh, and he was terrible. How did he deal with people as that type of antichrist in that time? He comes to Jerusalem and he kills approximately 80,000 people. All right. Death follows anytime Satan's in dominance. All right. Um, we have here a similar thing. If this is where Satan's seat is, you have death very present. You have deception. I mean, people think they're doing the right thing. All right? But it was awful. I cannot and will not speak in public to you about what they did to people. All right? It's just wrong. Okay? But the enemy is cruel. The enemy hates anything to do with God. That's why Israel's having trouble since they're God's chosen people. But it's also why in some parts of the world, especially if you happen to have faith in Christ in a place like Sudan or China or uh, Ethiopia, because uh, I've heard really bad stories from those areas today, uh, recently, has been for some time because they don't want God. Anytime you have a, a void of God, you can pretty well piece it together. Somebody very evil has a grip on that government, all right? And that's, uh, it's tragic. But then again, I, I like to reference our <coughs> folk song, This World is Not Our Home, we're just passing through. There's a better time. We've read the end of the story, and there is a much better time coming. But that does give you some idea of what's happening here. And oh, if that's not enough, uh, behind the city there was a huge conical hill, and it had all the other gods on it. <laughs> so it was... It was a, a idolatrous center of activity. Now, to live there means that the Christians are not just, you know, passing through and visiting Pergamum. It's their home. It's where they live. They can't get away. All right. That's like asking any one of you, how do you feel right now about taking another big move? 
<laughs> if you're like me, you'd be like, I think not. You know, I've done the boxes a couple of times. Uh, I have found most of my furniture 20 years later. And so, no way. <laughs> Absolutely no way. This is where I live. Whatever happens in Morgantown is where I'm going to be for probably unless the Lord were to move me. And you have to be open to that. But unless he were, uh, it's where I foresee being for the rest of my life, really. Um, and I'm grateful that we're here, you know, during Dad's time. And I'll be very grateful if I don't have to move anything. I like what one pastor said one time, it's easier for people to move their church letter than for me to move my furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I very much appreciate that kind, of, that kind of thinking. And I think it's important to be with the people that you serve and to live among them. And so it's just a real privilege just to be here. Now, you'll notice in these churches, and you may have noticed already with the two that we've already seen that there's kind of a three-part sequence. The first part usually is some sort of commendation from Jesus. This is what's going good. The second part is a correction. This, this needs work. This is a problem in your church. And the third one is repent. And that repent means immediately. It doesn't mean, okay, I'll scratch my head and think about it. It means you want to get on the stick right now. Or what happens? The candlestick is taken away. I think we have already mentioned what that means. What does it mean when our candlestick is taken away from a church? It no longer has any influence for Christ. It's no longer pointing people to Jesus. It, it dries up and dies. And if you were to go to Asia Minor today, can you say that if you were to go to Ephesus or Pergamum, and of course all the names are different now, but if you were to go there, would you find strong gospel preaching churches right in the heart of town? You know, probably not. It's mostly Islamically dominated now. So, and so it could be very difficult to find anything in, uh, there may be pockets. I don't want to speak for the whole area. I knew a missionary to Turkey once. I also knew that it was very difficult for a person from that Islamic background to take that break. Because what does it mean if you step out of your Islamic background? Who do you lose? You lose your family immediately probably in many instances uh, so it's, it's very difficult and people don't really want to commit that was the big thing that I learned from our missionaries back in the day and you are asking a lot if a person turns to Christ from that background so that's a uh, I think you can safely say as far as the geographical cities that light was there and that light seems to have been extinguished that should serve as a warning for any church I think in fact, if you trace churches over time, if it starts at one point in time, generally speaking, if you're not careful, the church tends to deteriorate. It even follows the pattern over here on the wall. If you look <coughs> about halfway across, you notice that our address to the different churches there, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and so on. You notice how they're kind of descending? As they descend, things are, generally speaking, getting worse and worse till you reach Laodicea, which is a church, I suppose, if you were to put one word to it, that is pretty much not committed to anything. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Philadelphia was an exception. I probably would have bumped Philadelphia up a notch or two on that overall thing, but the, the tendency there uh, is for it to decrease in influence. So by the time you get to... Uh, by the time you get to lay it to see you, there is not a lot of commitment to Christ. So, we have these things. Now, the other statement, these things, saith he, that has the sharp sword with two edges. And you thought I was beyond that, didn't you? <laughs> the sharp sword with two edges. Understand that the Roman proconsul, the sword was their status symbol. They thought they ruled little realizing probably that they were pawns in the hands of the enemy, but ultimately God is in control and he can take the king's heart wherever he wills. Jesus says to these Christians, living in probably a rather oppressive condition, hey, you know what? I know that Rome has a sword. I know that many of you are personally seeing a sword. I just want you to know I've got the sword with two edges on it, with the word of my mouth, all I have to say is a word, and it's over. I ultimately hold control of the universe. 
So a person can get by with something in this life, if you will, but the moment you take your last breath, you don't get by with anything. Because the person with the double-edged sword is the person that is ultimately in control. Everybody answers to God when shop closes. And uh, that's uh, just a fact. So if you are living there where Satan's seat is, people may speak evil of you. Because of the confusion, people may misunderstand what you're about. Uh, communications can be garbled because confusion is the work of the adversary. And every time there's a communication break, incidentally, I always like to put in there, if you truly did have an issue that you wanted to discuss, please don't text me. That's the worst form of communication in the world, and you can't tell how somebody's taking you. There are some people, bless their hearts, if you can't text, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Say something. Uh, I'd rather see people eye to eye because you can, you can eliminate so much mess if you could just see the eyeballs of another person. So if you ever do have an issue with me, please talk to me personally uh, and please tell other people to do so too. It's impossible to work out details. Uh, it's not fair to anybody really. It's not fair to you, it's not fair to me. And then what happens after all when you have a miscommunication with, with somebody at the church? Well, how's the light of the gospel going at the church? Because, well, I can't trust that church. Let me tell you how they treated me. And the word gets around, and then people drop out. You know what? It's very unfortunate, but I think I know who's behind confusion. All right? So communication is so, so important. And I think you all understand. I'm no dictator. I, am a, I, I see the pastor, as the Bible says, the under-shepherd. That means that the pastor is to serve you. He is to be the servant. Jesus did what? He washed his feet. What does the pastor do? He's going to follow his Savior, and he's going to try to wash feet and figure out how to serve. But anyway, I hear it starting to do something. I may have to get louder, so I will if I have to. <laughs> anyway, if you're a church that's suffering, remember what Jesus said in Matthew, I believe, chapter 7. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and speak, persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. You remember as a church then that ultimately Jesus is in control. Uh, talked about the gods there. We talked about Caesar, we've talked about the devil's ruling and, and some of the characteristics of it. I'd like to look at the correction part of this passage. This is verse 14. We saw the commendation. He's commending them. You're living in a tough spot, Pergamons. <laughs> Fellow Pergamites, <laughs> however you address them. But he says, I have a few things against you, Jesus said, because you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So you have them also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Well, we need to pay attention to what it is that the Lord's warning them against. The doctrine of Balaam is basically the opposite, uh, or basically the opposite of, of loving the Lord with all your heart. If you were to look at 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, very familiar passage of Scripture. I think it describes the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does God the Father really care about? How much money we have? What kind of materials we have? No, he cares about people. All right? You can, there are some people that, and, and you, all you have to do is turn the TV on, and you know there are some people, all they are after is money in the name of the gospel outreach. My friends, the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, while he lived, was asked by a king, seeing these 11 million Jews coming up through, is asking this prophet Balaam to curse these people 
And so in the story, Balaam gets to the position, I'm skipping the story quite a bit, but he's getting to the position where he sees all these people, and Balak says, I'm asking you to curse them so that so that I can survive this thing, and you know, we 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 don't we want them pretty much subjugated here. We don't want to mess with them. Just curse these people. Balaam starts, and you know what he does? He blesses them. He can't help it. What's coming out of his mouth is a blessing. These are God's people. You can't help but bless God's people. Balak says, this isn't working. Look, I, I give you practically half my kingdom here, but you've got to curse these people. And what does Balaam do? Well, he tries again, and then you know what happens? He blesses them a second time. And then it happens a third time. He says, I can't say any more than what God's put in my mouth. So that's the, that's the story behind Balaam uh, in this passage. Uh, but what he does do, and our passage gives us a clue, he tells Balak something. He says, look, if you buddy-buddy with these people and bring them to your parties and get them involved in some of your idol worship, if you get them to intermarry with your people that are committed to other gods besides the true God, then these people will be cursed. What did the people do? What did Balak do? He invited them in. He made them part of their partying crowd. And literally it became a situation where 24,000 Israelites lost their lives because of their interaction with idolatry. Sin always destroys, right? And sin certainly did a double whammy. They were what? Cursed. And so what does God think of Balaam? If you go to Jude, Balaam is in the same crowd as Korah. Korah was swallowed up by an earthquake. <laughs> and Balaam is in the same company as fallen angels, demons. So what does he think of today's televangelists that are asking you for money? All right. It ought to be very crystal clear that they're going to answer to God. But also... When we look at the aspect of love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if we value possessions and money over the precious people that God made, what are we doing? We're walking in the way of Balaam. All right? If the church has to do something to attract a group of people, something to attract people, what are we doing? Love not the world. Well, what if I offer pizza every Sunday morning? Well, I might attract some kids or something, but it's not the way to go at it. There's nothing wrong in a youth group having a youth activity, that sort of thing. But even when we look at the communion table, you know, those people are getting together and they're just not doing things right. So it's very important that we regard the worship of God where he belongs. And when you go down this road, and it's a temptation. Hey, I want more people. Sure, what do I got to do? I don't know. You know and the sky's the limit as to what you start doing. And you know what happens? What happens to your light? It's going to go out. And what happens ultimately to, uh, <coughs> to the person that's busy orchestrating all this? He has to answer to God. So you can bet before I do anything really dumb, I think about Balaam, because that's, that's a really serious position. I, I would not want to be in the same category as demons on the day that I testified before God. Really would not. So love not that world. Don't love the things in the world. If you truly have the love of the Father, you love God with all your heart, and you love your neighbor like yourself, and you're seeking to serve. That's what you try to do. Well, uh, moving right along here, uh, we're doing pretty good here. People can be deceived in their walk with Jesus. If we cater to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And that's something that Antipas would not do. Antipas would not go down that road of Balaam. Neither would he go down the road of the Nicolaitans. Now, uh, again, if we are looking at, ba at, at Pergamus, probably what they did in the name of Balaam, they said, well, it's no big deal just a pinch to Caesar, and you can join our guilds, because the guilds were very important. The trade guilds. You want a job? Better offer your pinch. You don't want a job? Too bad. All right? You see that it's the ramifications of this thing. 
if you look if you look in one area up in Smyrna, uh, it, they'll go after your life. If you look at Pergamum, they'll go after your life, but they'll also go after your job. All right. So these are things to think about. And and the message Jesus seems to say is to the church is even though you live in this world, you're in the world, you're not of it. Do you value me more than anything? Because after all, I valued you more than anything. It's fair. It's only fair. It's our reasonable service to be a living sacrifice, as Paul would say. Look, you've done this for me, so you, anything you ask, I, I very much desire to please you, Jesus. And so what is it that I can do? How can I reach it? And pleasing Jesus is like this. Being a light so somebody else can go to heaven. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, it's, it's a blessing to be able to point others to Jesus. So that's important. Now let's talk about these Nicolaitans again for a second. Nicolaitan, literally, if you take the word and break it down, it means to lord over people. Again, I think we mentioned that not only does it have the idea of lording over people, but it really, to me, it represents the Judaizers, the people who would say, yeah, you can have your faith in Christ, but you also need to observe this new moon. You need to observe these feast days. You need to do our list for you. Well, wait a second. How is a man saved? By faith. Plus what? Nothing. Nothing. By faith. And all around our world today, you know, in the extreme cases that I've seen, like I believe it was India where somebody was taking up a cross or somebody has all these hooks in their back or something. God doesn't want any of that. He simply wants us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we can be saved. And so it's terrible when the Nicolaitans come in and say, yeah, well, you can believe, but also you need this. No, also you need nothing. You just need Jesus. And, and the Bible is very clear on this point. At some point in time, if it gets too loud, I will have to shift to prayer requests because the video will no longer be able to sustain our chatter. But so far, so good. We're doing all right. He says this, and I think we're in the home stretch. Repent, else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm glad that he says he won't fight against you as the person that is using your ears. But he has an issue that he will take up with people that are going to go down these very wrong, wrong roads. And we already mentioned that it means repent at once. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to Churches, he that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. That manna is God's word, finding out what's important to him. As well, there's a white stone. Now that white stone, back in these days, if you got a white stone, it was a pardon of some kind, or it was a ticket to some kind of activity. That white stone is indeed a ticket. Jesus says what? I am the way. It is your ticket. Jesus is your ticket to your eternal home. Jesus is your ticket to the fruit of the Spirit. All right. He is also, however, your pardon given from the judge from all the sins that might stain you. So isn't that interesting how that white stone plays in? Who would have, have thought there would be such a thing? But, you know, in light of the world's headed for destruction, but we see what Jesus has to offer, and he offers you that white stone. Now, I heard that the name on that white stone could be the Lord's own name. However, when I read this passage, it says nobody knows it but who? But God. And so, frankly, if we knew that it was Jesus, then that would contradict our passage, I should think. So I think this is something that, that Jesus gives you personally for sticking it out against all odds. I mean, it wasn't fun. And Hebrews 11 is full of people that are like that, that had the, boy, this wasn't fun. I, I wouldn't have voted for this. How many of you really would have liked to have been the prophet Jeremiah? Raise your hand good and high. Y'all aren't raising your hand for anything today. <laughs> but so far, they've been jobs that, that nobody would, would rationally choose. And yet God uses people like that when he needs to. I also see here that... Uh, 
I'm, re I'm reminded that this puts me in the mind of the Lord's prayer for us and John 17 verse 14 and following I have given them Jesus said thy word the manna I will give you that manna thy word and the world hated them because they're not of the world even as I'm not of the world so if the world hates Jesus and they're giving you a hard time you know what it's okay you have good company <laughs> all right so much better company Balaam had really bad company however if Jesus is your company the end game is fantastic all right I pray not that you should take them out of the world verse 15 in John 17 but that you should keep them from the evil they are not the evil meaning sin keep them from getting stained by what the world's doing uh, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world sanctify them or set them apart through your truth thy word is truth so it is not that I would tell you to study your Bible though I encourage it but what's God saying get in your Bible it's truth it will help set you apart it will protect you from the evil of the world around you you'll understand what God values and you'll say okay look God if you value this I want to value this too all right I don't want to value what God values I was thinking of the surface of the Sun the other day and I thought you know God can walk on that thing and none of us are gonna get close I think I'll side with God the adversary, I know he's got his issues and stuff, but I don't want to go down that road. Every possible association I have with the adversary represents death. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So I'm going to park it with Jesus. And you sent me, verse 18, into the world, even so I sent them into the world. You're an ambassador. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified we're set apart to God through the truth. Of course, God's word again is the truth. I don't pray for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me through their word. That one's for us. Prior to this, we were talking about the disciples. That they may all be one as you, the Father, in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Experiencing God for yourself personally. Don't you love those quiet moments, especially when you really are tuned in? And you kind of hate those moments when you're tuned out, don't you? Verse 22 through 24, the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Whoa. Did you hear that? The glory that God the Father has given Jesus Christ has been given to who? Who? Okay. You. All right. I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. That's why you don't want to play that little game about, uh, blessed be the tie of the mind. <laughs> you want to be a good, you want to be a good uh, and welcoming church. Verse 23, I am them, and you and me, Father, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me, and you've loved them as you loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom you've given me, be with me where I am. Now there's our end game. Guess what? The time's coming when you get to be with Jesus. That's the whole point. That you might behold Jesus' glory, the glory that God the Father gave Jesus. You loved me before the foundation of the world. Well, now that's the way to go. Reminds me, if you will, of a little song that some of you might know. Sometimes the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. If you know the verses by heart, you're welcome to sing with me because I'm going to sing. And I only got ten notes, but it goes like this. At times the sky seems dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in hand who 
knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problems. Just go to him in prayer. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow Finally, life's day will soon be our all storms <laughs> forever past. Aren't you grateful for that? We're having trouble with that today, aren't we? We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished, we'll lay our burdens down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So this way, verses 25, 26. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them. It's about love, guys. Loving God, loving your neighbors, and I in them. In this world you will have tribulation just like the folk in Pergamum, but be of good cheer. You're on the winning side. Jesus has overcome the world. All right. <laughs> we may 